We got the Todd and Todd pod this week. Todd Jones from Nails is the guest, background in a variety of hardcore bands, Carry On, notably Terror, all kinds of good stuff. And Todd and I talk a lot about music on this podcast since I am an admirer of his creative output and we dig into how he thinks about writing songs, spend a, a little bit of time kind of going back and forth on getting into music and all that kind of stuff. And Todd also has a podcast that's relatively new called Unsilent Death, which is awesome. So if you are a fan of heavy music and conversations about heavy music, you need to head over to the podcast player you're listening to this on and check out some of the episodes of Unsilent Death as well. And here's my conversation with Todd Jones from Nails. Like, I bet we got into a lot of the same stuff at the same time still. Like, I bet you remember Nirvana being on the radio and shit. Oh, of course. Yeah. Were, were you into music by then? Yeah, I liked the rock station in Chicago was called Q101. Okay. And so, you know, they would play Nirvana and Pearl Jam and Echo and the Bunny Men and whatever. So that so, was, I, I was into that stuff. And then the first music I got really into yes. was, you know, Green Day, Mighty Mighty Boston, okay. things like so that. So that's when music hit for you? Cool. So like yeah. that's, that's, that kind of tells me, okay, I, I don't know. It's not like a bad thing. I just... I, it just, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, but it is really interesting thinking about like, okay, what what trajectory did someone go on to, like, actually get into stuff? Yeah, because you see a lot of a lot of hardcore people like now, they didn't. Um, punk rock wasn't like something wasn't their gateway into it, and I feel like for you and I, when the you know the Green Day and the Offspring like exploded onto mainstream music, where our minds were at that time, you know that that you know, we, we got into that and then it's like, then, you know, you get into whatever the epitaph, the fat record stuff or just yep. whatever. And then you get into, you find hardcore, you find minor threat or you, then you find youth of the day or whoever. And, um, I don't think, I don't know if people have an experience like that now. I hope they do. But like, I, I feel like it's like okay, popular bands, like what, what's their gateway and like, do they find hardcore through death core? Like, yeah, probably. Like, I don't like, I, I, you know, I won't, I won't know until, you know, five or 10 years. And when I get a chance to meet these kids, so then I could talk to them. It's like, Hey dude, how'd you get to <laughs> <laughs> outline, outline your path for me, please. Yeah. It's, well, it's interesting. Like I, like I just not even to judge. I just want to know, like, it's just, it's so interesting. Like, cause I, you know, it's, I know what it was like for me to find hardcore and like how important it was to me and assume people have that same importance. So I want to hear their story. I think it's cool. Yeah. I mean, I think there's also an element of certain types of people are going to really dig into stuff, right? That they're going to listen to something and then start tracing it and putting pieces together. But I actually think most people just kind of don't do that at all, even within subgenres, right? That, yeah, people into something like hardcore or metal or whatever, yeah, it's going to select for that type of person who's going to dig. But even within that, I think people just kind of like have the few bands that their friends listen to and, you know, it's just kind of like a, a melting pot of whatever for them. I think you're right. I also think it has to do, I think people are just naturally drawn, well, maybe Americans too, um, to things that are happening like right now. Like if it happened in yeah. the past, they, they just don't care. And I've, I've never had that, um, mentality but i'm aware that oh, i think a lot of people do yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well i was listening to a, a podcast with brendan kelly from lawrence arms broadway's slapstick oh, yeah. and he was actually he said something that resonated with me so much where he's like talking about a band he was in in high school and he's like i liked a lot of music but it didn't really have like defined categories for me. He's like, I basically thought that minor threat and mother love bone were just the same kind of band. That's great. Right? Cool. That's a cool I, perspective too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I probably had something similar, you know, in high school where it's like, yeah, you're sort of aware of like metal versus ska versus punk or whatever. But I don't think I really had super clear boundaries between like Iron Maiden and, Dillinger Escape Plan and the Lawrence Arms and Thursday or whatever I was listening to at the time. It was all just kind of like, yeah, this is this is the stuff that I like. This is un but did you did you also equate it to like like kind of like an underground thing too? Oh, for sure. Okay. Yeah, because I remember 
you know, we, we, I mean, we're talking about Offspring, Green Day, et cetera, being on the radio. And, you know, an, an older kid in my math class who had a cool older, older brother told me about like Less Than Jake and Operation Ivy, you know, and those were the first bands that I got right. into that were not on the radio. And I went to the local record store and, you know, realized there was this whole section of CDs of stuff that wasn't on the radio. And that just completely blew my mind. I was like, there's an entire world. What is this? It, um, you know, it was like, it was just like a portal opening up or whatever. I'm trying to think of when I had that moment. Like uh, the one thing I remember, like, I remember hearing Meyer threat. Like I remember everything about it, but like the cool thing is where I live, we had this record store called Salzer's that's still there. I hope it survives COVID, but um, yeah, it was just, it was full of music. Like it was like, I, like I had a really, really, really good record store. Like when I was a teenager, not records like vinyl, but like, cause vinyl didn't become hip, but just places where I could find music. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I remember hearing my threat and thinking like, this is hard. This is hardcore for some reason. I like, put that together and I, I felt like it was like what I was looking to hear for my whole 13 years on this planet thus, <laughs> thus far. I remember thinking to myself, I've been waiting my whole life to hear this. <laughs> I remember thinking that and I was like, it was just such a great moment. But to, at 13, to think, I've been waiting my whole life. It's like I've lived 13 like three times already now. <laughs> yeah, very, very painful 13 years pre minor threat. Yeah, I don't know how I lived those years without hearing them. <laughs> don't know how I did it. <laughs> um, although, I mean, we, we were talking about this a little bit. I'm not sure if we had started recording yet, but for, for myself, what's interesting is that I actually kind of got into um, like hardcore, but I didn't actually like hardcore that much, if that makes sure. sense. Right. Yeah. Like I liked a lot of punk stuff. I liked a lot of metal stuff. I liked a lot of that sort of, you know, angular technical at the drive-in type of stuff, but things like minor threat and black flag and things like that. I mean, I, I was obviously aware of them, but that didn't really resonate with me that much. And I kind of got into that stuff a bit later. I sort of had to circle back and be like, you know what? This is actually pretty cool. Wow. That's great. So, so what's the stuff you liked at the time? You said like at the drive-in and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, definitely at the drive-in, um, a lot of the Chicago bands like Lawrence Arms and Broadway's Honor System, Alkaline Trio, um, some metalcore stuff. Yeah. Like, I mean, like Converge, Dillinger Escape Plan, uh, you know, like uh, all, all that kind of stuff that was more technical and kind of weird. Yeah. And a lot of hardcore stuff was a little bit too simple for me because I was, you know, like a pretentious fuck, and it 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 didn't it didn't have that like visceral you know, resonance with me that something like whatever converge or slayer. Did. Yeah. It sounded like you were, you, you were a guy who probably like, like the, um, eclectic stuff, like not slayer, yeah. but, but more like the converge zones or escape plan, even like Lawrence arms and, and alkaline trio, like, like those bands in their genre aren't, I wouldn't say accessible because they are accessible bands, but they're not like, like, okay, you would, somebody might call Alkaline Trio a pop punk band and they wouldn't be wrong, but like Alkaline Trio is like, like, they're not like a surface level pop punk band. They're not like a Blink-182 right. or a, uh, I don't know, but like they're newfound. Global. Yeah. Or like that, like they, they're like, they are, it's like kind of how you said angular, like they, they're not maybe angular, but they have these like things about them that make them unique that a person who likes eclectic music would would dig and it sounds like that that was like more of your style like just like eclectic crazy music yeah i mean i think i think for myself it was you know i'd be like oh if a if if this band only plays in four four and only uses power chords i'm not interested like yeah, I, want, that's fair. I want something weird yeah you need slant yeah <laughs> i need something something a little bit odd what's that record that's their famous record. Uh, Spider Spider Land? Land, yeah, where they're in the they're in the lake. I used to jam that record. Yeah, it's definitely uh, uh there's a lot going on on that thing. Yeah, there is. It's we and it's. I mean, that's fucking eclectic. That's like, let me speak. I mean, he didn't do that through all the songs, but there's like one or two songs where it's like he's just speaking or reading, and it's like it works. Like it's cool. Yeah. Like it's not like it's like it helps the vibe of whatever that song is. It's a good record. Great record. But for you, it sounds like the uh, the the more just straight ahead aggression was more 
more what you were into. Yeah, big time. Like I, like up until like I, when I was like thirteen, like I so I got into music through like Nirvana and Metallica, like the mainstream stuff, yeah. rock stuff at that time, like ninety two, and then like I found Slayer, so I was into Slayer, and then um, Green Day came out, and my friends and I would we liked that, we liked Dookie and Offspring, and then we would look at the thanks list for the for those records. And Five Rancid and No Effects and Operation IV, of course. That was one of the first bands. Yeah. And Rancid and and Good Riddance. The first punk band I ever saw was Good Riddance. And then um, I, I, that's awesome, actually. Yeah, dude. They, I, I mean, I I was a huge and still am a big fan of Good Riddance. I think they're they're great. And um, and but in my youth, they were like a really they were a band I I saw a lot. They played Ventura and Oxnard and in, in, in Santa Barbara areas kind of often. Um, but, uh, and I heard minor threat somewhere in there and I was like, Oh my God, this is it. Like, it was like a, just a, a shiny light moment. And I've heard black flag and like, uh, I loved my war even at that age. Like I, I love that record, but, uh, strange record. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, something that might be good to, to sort of dig into then is based upon, you know, your, your sort of resonance with some of the hardcore stuff and this may change over time, but do you experience music more as like an emotional thing or do you experience music more as something that's kind of like a, I don't know, like an abstract world to play with? Probably an emotional thing. I don't, um, and abstract, but I don't, I don't, I, I guess when I'm, when I'm being creative with music, I don't do it necessarily in an abstract form. I do it more of a, like a, the typical folk song structure, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, and the song's over. Um, that's just how I kind of learned to write songs. I mean, I'm a, you know, my first foray into music at all was Nirvana, Nevermind, and Black Album, Metallica. You know, those are, yeah. you know, it doesn't get any more mainstream than that, than those, than some of those records. So it's like, I don't know if I'm necessarily attracted to that song structure because of that, but I'm just, I don't know. I was just, I, I, I don't necessarily think of, I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't find myself being attracted to, to writing like more progressive type stuff, but I listen to it all the time. Like one of my favorite bands currently is, um, this band Ulthar, this metal band from Oakland. And they're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. They're like more of like the progressive, like kind of metal, like not like they do have some songs that are the typical folk structure, but they have a lot that aren't. And they're really like creative and they have cool parts and shit. But like I, I listen to like stuff like that and, and love it. But I, I don't know. I just my mind doesn't work that way. I guess. Yeah, th- Ulthar is awesome. We they, they they were on that tour that uh that you guys did last summer, and we played that show yeah. in Chicago. That's right. Um, and they have a new record coming out soon ish. Right. Last actually last Friday, so about five days ago or oh. four days ago. It's great. Yeah, it's called Providence. It's really good. It's, it's definitely, um, it kind of sounds like a, a verse Sephira. I don't know if you ever listened to that band. No, I haven't heard of them. What, what how, how do you, how do you say their name again? It's a verse Sephira. Okay. They're like a weird kind of like dissonant technical black metal band. When I think of, when I think of that description, I think of death spell Omega. Yeah. Like a verse Sephira is a little less heavy and a little less uh let's say like overtly technical but it's definitely like strange okay i got you oh i know who you're talking about Um, i can see the name in in their head now yeah they're they're from texas oh cool um but yeah so for you then it sounds like music is something where it's like okay i have this sort of feeling and i want to put it into this this package that then delivers that feeling to someone else yeah, I suppose so. I don't, I, I, I've always, I dude, I just love 12 inch records. So it's like, even before I started nails, I was like, I want to have a 12 inch record. It's like, I think that's like where it starts out. Like I, <laughs> I could do a 12 inch record. So I, I started thinking, well, how, you know, I started thinking about the track list. Eat. I started thinking about like the aesthetic of it and, and all that stuff. But, um, that's the goal is, is, you know, is, I mean, I don't know if it's the goal, but you know, if you put something out there to the world, I mean, 
I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of the types of emotions you could feel about it, but one of them I would assume is that you're, you're interested to know how other people are going to take to it. Like, you know, are they going to dig it? Are they not going to dig it? Am I going to get constructive criticism? Am I going to get shit on? Like you just, you just never really know what, how the world's going to take it. If, if anybody's even going to hear it, but but uh, that's that the idea. That's the idea, I guess. Is hopefully, hopefully, other people could relate with you, and the the tunes on it. Yeah, and I think that something else that's interesting for for you is that you're obviously a fan of heavy music, like have been, still are currently actively listening to bands. You know, some people who are creative and involved in heavy music get kind of jaded on it stop checking new stuff out potentially don't listen to stuff because they don't want to influence them whereas others are kind of like always taking stuff in and synthesizing it and then sort of like incorporating that into their their own creative output how how do you how do you think about that i don't know man i I think i've just i've always been a not always but I, i think of myself as a fan of music maybe more than i do think of myself as a musician um like i'm aware i'm a musician but i'm just I'm always looking for new music that I, that I want to hear and listening to music and, and just trying to find things that I like. Um, it's funny because like, you know, when nails goes on tour, we'll pick like our opening bands and we'll like, I'm always, I like I've, I've ran into people where I'm like, yeah, I heard your thing. It's really awesome. And they're like, what, how did you hear it? Oh my God. They're like, they're surprised that it reached me. And I guess I could understand that. I don't really I understand it. I don't really look at myself that way, but like, um, music's so accessible. I mean, band camp, there you go. You know, if you got a band camp and a friend who will post about it on Instagram, who's like, you know, kind of popular, then you got a following <laughs> already. But, um, yeah, I don't know, dude. I just, I, I love hearing new music. You know, I don't like everything. Um, that's definitely not the case, but there's a lot I do like. All right. The connection dropped briefly here. So, editing this together in a way that kind of comes back in where we were talking about something basically completely different, but enjoy. There, there's, there's people out there who project themselves in a certain way and when they're really not that way. And that's, that's fine too. I mean, I guess that's part of the allure and part of, it's probably part of the story and what makes people like music and everything. That's a good point too, right? That, that if you think about someone who's a musician, they're playing a bunch of different roles, right? They're playing the role of the person who's potentially actually writing the music. They're playing the role of the sort of like character that presents the music to the world. They're playing whatever role they play within the band in terms of, you know, managing the band and keeping everyone on the same page and organizing stuff. And that not all of those roles, um, whatever are, are beneficial to, to sort of be in the public eye, let's say. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, like when you start a band, you don't think about things like that. Like, like I want to be a person who puts themselves out to the press and, and makes myself available to the press. And I want to be a person who has to run three different social media sites and put myself out to everybody there. Or I want to be a person who is in a video. And then, you know, what does that imply? That implies playing, you know, to a song, that, and you're not actually playing. It's just you, there's a lot of weird things that come along with being a musician in the in the in, in what you said about roles, and um, you know some people just don't do those roles very well, and some people do. Like there's a lot of things that I do for nails behind the scenes that I feel like I do very very well, and then there's things I do for nails that maybe I don't feel I do very well, but you know tough shit because that's part of being in a band. So you just got to suck it up and deal with it. <laughs> what, what, what do you feel like you do well? Um, I feel like I, I know how a record is released from, from the start of writing a song to, to promoting it online. Like, I feel like I could do that pretty well. Like I, I know how to, um, work with a label and, and, get with them to make sure that the release can be as successful as it can possible be possibly be. And, um, it took me a lot, a lot of years to figure that stuff out. A lot of trial and error. Um, just knowledge, I guess I've picked up along the way of being a musician. I feel like I'm pretty good at, um, just kind of making things happen behind, behind the scenes. Like if I need to get a t-shirt design, I could figure out, 
you know, how to contact an artist, how to get them paid. I could figure out how to get the files over to the t-shirt guy. I could, you know, work with the t-shirt guy. So they get all the things they need to get the t-shirt printed. Um, I know how to contact a booking agent and have them book a tour, um, know how to contact the promoter, just a, a lot of the legwork stuff that I've seen over and over and over again. Um, just stuff like that. I, it's, it, I, I like doing stuff like that. It's, it's, um, it's neat to see things come together. Yeah. So just kind of like the, the project management aspect of, of running a band, it sounds like. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. I mean, I, I, I think I'm all, I think I'm okay at, at doing what I do at nails from the creative aspect. Like I like, I like all of nails music and it's exactly what I wanted it to be from when I started the band. So I'm, I'm pretty psyched on that. So you mentioned the idea of, you know, sort of project managing a record and having to learn a lot in order to make it successful. What, what, what's, what are a few of the things that maybe you learned that you had misconceptions about or didn't realize were important starting out? Yeah, I can tell you one thing. I had a conversation with somebody recently mastering and how, and how mastering a physical vinyl record is a completely different separate process of mastering music. To, to be prepared to go to press. Um, I wish that that process was spoken to or documented more for me when I was like a, a tyke learning how to press vinyl records and going <laughs> through the motions. <laughs> Just a wee boy. Yeah. But like, you know, sometimes people will use like one term for two separate things that, that are two completely different processes. And that's, that's one thing that I think, like a very fundamental thing that I think I got confused. Um, another thing I learned and I learned this recently from my experiences of doing a podcast is I learned how to record a signal or how to record a voice properly. And what I mean by that is I've learned how the, the mic attaches to the preamp for the mic and then it goes from there to the interface and from there to co the computer and just basically how the computer is, can take that signal and and ingest it and so it can read it and make it so you know you can basically record your voice um, that's something that as a young musician I kind of put my hands up in the air and, and said I don't know when it comes to being technical about recording and learning stuff and I really wish I didn't do that at a young age and it because it's really not that hard um, it's just a concept and you know, you just go over it a few times until you get it. And, uh, I, I wish I did that at a younger age. And, and do you feel like that gives you more insight and potentially more ability to kind of, to, to shape the final product by understanding that? Yeah. I mean, it gives me more power, right? Like it makes me have the ability to have a nicer product, I guess. Like I'm like, I'm not, my, my podcast is like a pretty, um, I would say it's, I would say it's a pretty basic thing because the idea is that I'm just calling people and talking to them on the phone for like, you know, 40 to 60 minutes. So with that being said, what does that mean? That means I can do it from my house. That also means that I'm going to be recording people talking on their phone. So the recording isn't, you know, it's not going to be as legit as it could be if I was talking to somebody in person. So it like learning how to, just take a signal and record it makes it so that I could do the best job I can. And hopefully I can present something that people will listen to as opposed to hear the first five or 10 seconds and feel like, Oh my gosh, I can't listen to this. It sounds so terrible. Turn it off. So, um, that's, that's kind of what it gives me. I think I look at it that way is, is like, it gives, it gives you like knowledge and knowledge, knowledge does equal power. Like, it, it expands your tool set. So now, you know, when I go to demo, like, you know, some sort of musical idea that I have, like I'll know how to record my voice into the computer. So, and I, and on top of that, I'll, I've learned how to record other instruments too, as well. So, um, so I could make demos that other people can articulate and understand better, or I could just listen to myself for reference, um, stuff like that. Yeah, totally. So it's like making the, whatever the, the, the process of taking the kind of fuzzy ideas in your head and translating them into something tangible, just having that baseline technical knowledge makes that a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. That's the best way to describe it. Yeah. And I think that another potential 
scenario where that can be helpful is if you imagine someone in a technical job, right? And they may not know how to code, but they're managing people who do. And, you know, it's not like they need to necessarily become the best, you know, person writing Ruby on the team, but if they at least understand roughly how it works, all of a sudden that the, the process of figuring out how to get what you actually want to happen to sort of like, uh, achieve your creative vision becomes a lot smoother. Yeah. And it helps. And also in a situation like that, it would help you be able to communicate more effectively with your team. So, so everybody can have like a more clear understanding of the grand vision at large. Like, I don't know, man, I, I, I'm, I don't want to say I'm a lazy person, but there's a lot of things that I should have been a little bit more, I should have had more enthusiasm or I should have put more, uh, I should have put forth more effort because they would have helped enabled me at a younger age. And, you know, who knows what sort of things, um, could happen in regards to that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I think I was content with the fact that I knew how to play guitar well enough to play my hardcore songs that I was like, I don't need to pay attention to music stuff anymore. <laughs> yeah. That that's, um, I, I relate to that in the sense that a lot of folks who are into, you know, are in bands or into music or whatever can kind of get lost in the, like the gear rabbit hole, you know, knowing a lot about different amps and things like that or pedals or whatever. And I'm someone who like, doesn't know about that at all and doesn't care about it, like to a detriment. Right, I'm like it would probably benefit me to actually just learn about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's that's exactly what it is to what you said right now. Detriment, like people, and I think particularly musicians get comfortable with a certain level. Like when they when they uh, when they get to the level that they've been wanting to get to for a while, those kind of kick the feet up and 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 just kind of do their thing and, and enjoy what they have. And that's, that's fine. That's good. But what if you learned like an extra 30% more, like imagine how much, how much more capable you would be or how much, how much, um, what kind of sort of tricks you'd be able to do or, or just whatever. Um, I mean, I, I dude, YouTube is the most amazing invention of the, of all of social media or the past internet in yeah. the past 20 years. Like I've learned so much just by watching YouTube videos like like I've learned how to play like guitar licks or I've learned how to how to dial in an amp and and what like a master volume does like stuff like that like learning all that stuff will help you be a better musician for sure and like there's so many little things I just decided never to learn that I'm learning now and it's it's just awesome like it, it makes me appreciate it more I guess yeah, the, the volume of stuff available on YouTube is definitely, you know, when I was growing up, I cared about being good at guitar and would actually practice with the intention of becoming better. And for a long time, I didn't do that at all. And then YouTube happened in the interim, and I've actually been practicing guitar with some sort of purpose and agenda for the last several months. And yeah, I mean, the, you know, the ability to just go on YouTube and be like, okay, I'm going to learn to play over certain jazz chord changes. Let's see. Oh, there's like five of the best guitar teachers in the world who are just going to teach me how to do that. This, this is very helpful. Thank you. It's a, it's amazing. It's free as long as you have a computer and you can pay your internet bill. <laughs> so you touched on your podcast, which, you know, we were talking before about you just being a general fan of heavy music, right? Just actively consuming heavy bands for, decades at this point and you recently started talking to people in heavy bands and people who record heavy bands and putting those conversations out there is it, what's the deal with that is that just an extension of your of your fandom what's going on um i wanted a way that i could connect to nails fans without being on like instagram or twitter or facebook um and also I wanted to basically do what I'm doing, which is what you described, which is basically just reaching out to people and talking to them about their process, how they do things. You know, if they're, if, I, if I'm talking to them about their songwriting skills, I'll, I'll ask them about that. Or if they're like an engineer, I'll ask them questions about that. And the idea is that I'm not asking them, you know, why'd you name your album this? You know, like, just basically the standard fare questions that, yeah. that someone in a band may or may not get. Um, like I, I legit am a fan of the people I'm talking to in some sort of capacity. And 
and I want to ask them about about what they're doing because to me it's like okay you could be in a band or you could be an engineer and you can create and it's awesome but how the fuck did you do that like because I used to think that when I was like I still think it to this day when I read things but it's just like I'll, I'll read things on the internet like for instance there's bands who will go out there and say yep we're we're you know we're in a month we're going to go record a new album and we got about 30 songs that we're going to be sifting through and i think really you got 30 <laughs> fucking songs like from start to finish vocals like you have 30 songs and like i i was just like what the hell are these people talking about and it's like i talked to a friend of mine and i'm like what are they doing and and they explained it to me it's like no they don't have 30 songs what they have is 30 parts and they're saying that out of any one of those parts that they could develop that into a song. I'm like, that's crazy. Like, that's just like a preposterous thing to say. Like, <laughs> like if you don't have a song, you don't have a song. If you got 30 parts, then you got th- like, that's legit all you have. Like that you don't have an album's worth of material, but you know, people, people write songs differently and they'll, they'll go into the studio with parts and they'll create songs out of them in the studio. And then some people will, you know, before they go into the studio, they'll be hitting their rehearsal space and they're going to make sure that they have every little detail wrapped up. And, um, some people record like that. And, and, um, so even to this day, I still have questions like, what do you mean you did this? How do you do this? Like, what, what did you do here? And it's, it's, it's totally fan driven, but it's also a way that I haven't really figured it out yet, but, I I will have some sort of interaction with people. I just don't really know how to do that. Like one thing that that really grates on me and gets on my nerves, when I go to YouTube and I try to find like a guitar lesson or just basically something like an instructional type of video and the person who's doing the video is just sitting there talking for like a length of time, whether it's 40 seconds or three minutes and I'm just like, dude, just get to the description of your video. like like guitar solo lesson volume one, like just get to the guitar solo. So in my video or in my podcast episodes, I try to just be like, okay, here's our guest. This is how I met them. Cause I, I want to give people like a, uh, a perspective. And I assume that part of the reason why they're listening to the podcast is because I'm doing it. Yeah. Um, so like, it's not like I'm trying to insert myself into the story, but it's like, just like, Hey, uh, I'm talking to this person. Um, I met this person here, here, and here. I'm a real big fan of this person for these reasons. And then I get right to it. Like here, here's the phone call here. Check it out. See what we talked about. Um, so I think that's, I I think that's what it, that's what it is. It's still like a developing thing, but I want to try to get to a point where like, um, I don't know if I could have some like, um, Q and a sessions or I don't know really how to do it yet. I'm still, I'm still learning, but I want to have some sort of interaction with, with, you know, people who listen to it pending that they're interested in talking to me, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that you, you can probably give yourself a little bit more leeway on the, on the podcast intros, especially since people, like you said, they're listening to the podcast because they like a lot of people just like being a fly on a wall for conversations between people who they admire, you know, and, and which I think is different from the YouTube video where it's like, I'm literally watching this video so that I can learn how to change my car battery. Like, just show me how to change the battery. You know, mm-hmm. it's not, it, it's not like someone's like, I'm listening to this podcast with Todd and, and Dylan from full of hell so that I can learn this exact information. They just want to be there. Yeah. And I, and I, I'm a really self-aware guy to the point where I probably like beat myself up a little bit over it too much. Like I, I'm, I'm trying sure. my best here to, to not to not put myself in the middle of it. But, but again, like it's, it's my podcast, like (laughs) it's, that's going to happen. But I I just want to be, I guess my main point is I just want to be cautious of the listener's time because dude, I see a lot of podcasts out there. Um, I actually didn't realize how many there were out there until I started mine. And I'm like, wow, there's so much cool shit out there. There's like interviews with all these people and bands I like that I didn't know exist because I wasn't a guy who really, was looking for, for, for things in the app, av- the podcast Avenue. Um, I typically look for bands, just going to band camp or, or whatever. But, um, I just, I, I try to be like, I guess just considerate of the listener's time in that regard. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to 
and make them have to commit to something that's like two or three hours long, just so simply because it's not something I could do. We got to crank up that uh, that listening speed. Listen it three times. Plow that through. <laughs> it's superhuman to be able to decipher it at that fast. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Dude, I mean, honestly, I you know, once you start speeding up, you get used to whatever speed you're at, and you're just like, you just keep cranking it. You just keep dialing it faster and faster. <laughs> I get to about one and a half sometimes, like on Joe Rogan, because his shit will go like two or three hours. But it's rare that he puts something up where I want to see the whole thing. Yeah, totally. Um, well, and, and something you said earlier really resonated with me, which is, you know, if you're doing anything where you you know, are, are putting creative work out into the world or, um, you know, you have a business or anything like that, that there's sort of this, okay, you have to be on social media. That's where people are. And yeah, there may be some truth to that, but you know, your point about wanting to do something that allows you to, to connect with fans and put something out there that isn't just social media based, I think is, is really, really salient, right? Especially for certain types of personalities, you know, it's difficult to be like, okay, I'm going to make this post where I sort of like grandstand about something that I don't know about, or, you know, I try to make myself look cool. It's like, to me, I don't care about doing that, but I do care about having, you know, interesting, potentially technical conversations with people who do something that I admire. And I want to share that. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. No, that, yeah. Um, when you do a band, like when I'm doing nails and, and it's time to put more stuff out into the world, that's not music. So what is that? That's, what is that? Is that, is that music videos? That's promo pictures or just information. It's like, you, you really, you do it in a certain way. It's like, I'm not going to go out and take a picture in my pajamas, right? Like I'm not <laughs> going to like use that to promote my band, but like, I feel like with my podcast, I can be myself more so um, because there's more space and there's more time. Uh, you know, it's not like just a 140 character post on Twitter or it's not just a picture on Instagram or a posting on Facebook. It's like, you know, people hear me go back and forth with, with the people I'm talking to and whatnot. And I think it gives me sort of a less limiting way to have people, I guess, experience, um, you know, meet my, myself, I guess, if they're interested in nails or, or, and you know what, if they're not interested in nails and they're just there because they found, um, the guest, like they want to hear the guest and that's, that's cool too. I try to be considerate of that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And talking about this, I'm sort of thinking about, you know, people who were interested in internet culture in like the early two thousands, right. A lot of folks were engaging in message boards and reading blogs and things like that. And then the, the sort of whatever social interaction on the internet moved into social media. And I think a lot of the folks who are more interested in message boards and blogs have sort of moved on to like newsletters and podcasts for more like long form information rather than just kind of um, like social signaling behavior. Dude, you're, you're right. I, and you know, it's funny is I never separated the two, I, but you're right. There, there are people who, would follow blogs and have like RSS feeders and stuff like that. I was one of those yeah. people. I, I love, yeah. I love following blogs and, um, and those people have kind of converted to podcast, you know, blog spots have kind of been phased out for whatever. Well, probably because of podcasts, it's just a, it's just a better medium and you can get way more information out and you can, you know, with, with it being on your handheld device, it's so easy. I'll tell you what, I still use, uh, I still use Feedly, which I switched to after they killed Google Reader, whenever that was. Dude, I, I tried Feedly and I tried another one, but after they killed Google Reader, it just kind of it killed it for me. Like it was probably actually better off for me that I didn't keep tabs on so much stuff. <laughs> Well, yeah, as, as someone who sort of like creates fake assignments for myself that I have to complete, um, you know, the number of unread blog posts that I have at any given time is something that like actually kind of stresses me out. I'm like, this is a fake assignment that I made up for myself. This is, I'm assigning myself homework. I don't have what, to do this. Well, give me I an example. Give me an example of where you would assign yourself like a musical related um, task. What would, what would something like that be? Oh, sure. Well, so um, like a music related task would be all, um, I have just like endless playlists of things that I want to listen to. Right. So I'm like, okay, here's my assignment. I need to listen to, you know, I need to get this below this number of albums to listen to 
by this weekend or like playing guitar. You know, I've been, I've been taking lessons for the first time for the last several months and I have to, um, you know, I, I've been working on some, some modal improvisation and I'm not so good with knowing my notes. So it's like, okay, I have to, I have to be able to, you know, quickly switch between these chords in the Lydian mode by my next lesson. So I'll just like have little assignments like that, that I have to do. And then I get stressed when I don't complete them. Oh my gosh. That's, that, that's so cool though. I, I need to try that. Give myself like um, barriers to hit. Cause I've been trying to figure out a way, like I've, I've been feeling like I haven't been accomplishing as much as I should in my like pers- excuse me, I'm sorry, in my personal life. So I think I'm going to try that. I mean, I got my, I got my hands full. I got a band, I got a podcast and I got a family and a job, but um, I think that's why I feel like I haven't been able to accomplish uh, other things. Yeah, totally. Well, and I think that it's, it's, you know, there, there's a sweet spot to be found with anything like that, right? Where it's like, it's probably better to have some structure and some whatever agenda to force yourself to do something. But then the, the flip side of that is if you do that too much, then you just have a hard time prioritizing and are constantly stressed and feeling behind because you're like, I made an impossible to do list for myself that I can't do. And now I feel bad every day. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I feel that too. So I, you gotta find a happy medium. Yeah. Um, so to, to, to sort of put myself in the, the asking technical questions of someone that I admire for the, the betterment of everyone, let's talk about some, some songwriting stuff. How's that sound? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So in a, in a previous interview that I was listening to, you mentioned, um, Deicide's Once Upon the Cross as like an early foray into death metal. Um, and actually hearing you say that uh, kind of like made a bunch of like pieces click for Nails um, <laughs> for me, right? Because it's like, okay, Nails is a band that is um, like actually pretty technical if you think about like if you really pay attention to what's happening, but it doesn't necessarily come across as like a technical band if you're just sort of passively listening to it. Um, and I think that Once Upon the Cross is an album that's like that, where it's not as just absolutely crazy as Legion, which came before it, which like is just one of the most ridiculous records possible. Yeah. But it's not necessarily simple like some of the later Deicide stuff. Like there's a lot happening, but it just kind of like is very driving and 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 on the surface straightforward, which actually like. I think nails is it is very similar in that sense. Is that purposeful? Oh man, I mean I I think there's there's fewer things better when there's I, I love my favorite style of music is falls between anywhere between like um like the damned up until like youth of today. Like, so like, like, so like, like that early or that late seventies, UK punk, like early California punk or early eighties, California punk, um, New York hardcore that was like more like antidote and urban waste and stuff like that. And, and then youth crew, like, like chain of strength, gorilla biscuits, youth of today, straight ahead, like, like, and, and, And I know that's a wide berth of sound, but like, that's my favorite music. Like all that shit anywhere between there is my favorite music. Like I'm, I'm still like a tourist to the death metal genre, but Deicide once upon the cross was the first death metal record I heard. I heard it when I was a freshman in in high school. And I think that was like within six months of it coming out. And, um, like one thing, like, I don't know, I don't know, like when I first heard it, how it was going to affect me. But one thing that I'll, that I know that I could speak to now is like one of the things like I'll take from Deicide is, is their, is their fast double based with palm muted riffs. Like yeah. that's, that's like one of their carrier characteristics. And I think that's probably one of the things that I carried over from Deicide to nails. And, um, uh, I, I, I do like, so one of the things that I think is the best is, is it was when there's like punk and hardcore bands that are playing with like incredible musicianship. Like to me, that is so satisfying. Like, like punk can be primitive and, and extremely great. Like look at something like, like, like Jerry's kids or middle class where it's like the musicians, it's like, you know, they were playing kind of loose and sloppy, but fuck, those songs are so good. And those recordings are so good. And the idea, like, like just great, great, great music. But I just, I just love the idea of playing like super fast, angry music, but it's like really tight 
and has good musicianship behind it. Um, I do think that with nails, with a sound that's so narrow, like, cause we are, I would say our sound is very narrow. We don't really do melodic stuff. And, um, it's just a very narrow, narrow, like slim type sound. Like you have to find like new ways to make it interesting. So what does that mean to me? That means like, well, maybe we write a song that has a different tempo that we haven't used yet. Or maybe we write a song that has a certain vocal hook that, you know what I mean? Like I'm just trying to find new ways to make new ideas and new songs. And, uh, but, um, I mean, I just, I wanted, I, I, from the start, I wanted Nails to be about a band that like plays like all the time. Um, it hasn't really been that way, but I, I kind of wanted to get it back that way. But, um, but I just, I, I want to hear like, I want to hear like extreme attention on this kind of music because I feel like there's so many times when like, you know, you'll, you'll hear of like a grindcore band or a hardcore band. It's like, okay, you guys got together, practice three or four times and then here's a demo and it sounds like that. It sounds like you guys didn't spend a lot of time like refining your stuff. And it sounds like maybe you could have put a little more thought into something. And it's just like, I, I wanted it to be this thing that I obsessed over. And, um, and that anytime we put out a record that I felt like it was worth the 10 or 15 or $20 or however people buy music. Like I wanted them to feel like they got their, their, their money's worth out of it. Yeah. I think the, the idea you're, you're talking about of like, okay, you sort of committed to this form of music, right. Of, you know, we're talking before about mostly sticking with a, something close to a verse chorus song structure, right? Like, okay, this, these are going to be songs that are going to be relatively short. They're not going to be, you know, sprawling prog rock operas with 29 riffs. So, okay, given those constraints, how can you continue to make it interesting? And so something that I hear that makes nails particularly interesting is the, you know, the, the way that you sort of play with the, like the, the rhythms within riffs and the way that you tend to, um, you know, you use a lot of notes to kind of like convey something, right? Which, you know, like you're saying, that requires a certain amount of musicianship to be able to do that. But it's not like these are just, you know, simple riffs that pay off into a huge breakdown. It's like, okay, there's actually kind of a lot going on if you really pay attention to how, you know, those like quick little power chords um, in a fast part that, that, you know, could pass you by if you're not paying attention. But like that actually sets up the next part really, really well if you pay attention to the way the rhythms lead into each other. Like, are, are, you, are you paying attention to the, to the craft at that level? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's times, there's times it just depends on what the song, the raw idea of the song is. Like for instance, when the band started, I, I like, um, you know, the band was new, so I didn't think anybody was going to care about the band. I just wanted to make a record and hopefully my friends like it. And like the, the idea then was like, okay, I want to have a song. I would just be getting raw ideas. Like I want a song that from it goes it's 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 blasting and then there's a the stop and then it goes into a d beat okay there's a song and then i want a song that like it starts with a d beat and then it goes into like a mosh part or whatever like like all the songs started from raw ideas and then the band put out in silent death and then the band got fans and that was when it was like oh wow people like this, I guess let's like, not, I guess let's pursue this, but it's like, it kind of gives you more, uh, not drive, but it kind of gives you more of a reason to keep doing it. And it's not to say I only do nails because other people like it. That's not true. The main reason is I do it because I want to do it. But like when other people like it, it makes it easier, right? I mean, you go play a show, it's easier to play a show when people are there and, get paid a nice fee so you can put money in the gas instead of in the tank and go to your next show instead of play to nobody, not get any money and then be fucking broke and worried about doing it. So that's why it makes it easier. But it's like, dude, um, you know, there's sometimes when, when there's like a verse and like, I'll, I could say to myself, it's like, okay, I just need a riff to get me to the chorus on this one. Like I just, it, the riff here isn't, necessarily the most important thing about this particular song at this part like for the verse like the vocal pattern is what's going to carry the verse so i could play like 
I don't want to say like a simple or, or a lame riff, but I could just kind of get by with playing something. And then when the chorus comes in, you know, I have a really great riff that is like kind of like what you said, a payoff. And, you know, it, 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 it'll be heard in there. Um, I mean, the way I, the way I kind of look at it is, is, is if it doesn't give you the charge, then why would it give someone else the charge? And um, like Nails is just about, in the way that we write songs, it's just sort of about maintaining an energy. And like, you know, if, if we're jamming and we're playing this thing, like I could hear the energy either maintain or you could hear the energy drop. So that's when you just need to say, okay, this doesn't work. And it's like, go back to the drawing boards and figure out what you're going to do. Yeah. So you're kind of using your own internal compass for like, okay, does this, does this have the, the energy does this have the drive does the payoff actually hit here like okay this is building up pretty good and we definitely have to do like a pretty cool like vocal ug going into this part to make it you know really really slam or whatever yeah exactly it's just it's it's all internal you know and i think that's uh you know in a genre like hardcore punk and probably less so metal but even a little bit metal um you know everything's sort of been written right like there's not there are there there is some original stuff out there but even when it's original it's probably most people consider it progressive but um you know it, it, there's it's not so much about playing with a certain technicality as it is it's like your riff choices and where you decide to put parts and that's what makes someone have a style so if you're if you're writing a song then are you sort of thinking about okay you know, you said before, all right, I want a DB part and then it's going to go into a blast part and then it's going to go into this kind of part. Are, are you sort of seeing the big picture of how you want the song to unfold and then writing in riffs to um, fill those pieces? Or are you kind of starting from like, okay, this is going to be, you know, an awesome part. Like I, I have this idea for a chorus. Let me build a song around that or both. Um, I mean, most, most song ideas come from just straight one raw idea, whether that's like, you know, I want to have a mosh part like this, or I want to have a chorus with a vocal hook that's like this. But going like when as songs are going and moving from part to part, I would say that some of it will come to you as as, as I'm just like sitting there in my bedroom playing the playing the guitar riff. I might figure out the next riff, but some of it's like some of it's like man, I have you know I have you know I'm writing a new album right now, and it's like I have a stock of riffs. It's like do I have any riffs that will go well with this other part? And in events like that, like, I don't know if that's like dumb luck or, or, or whatever, but sometimes, sometimes just simply putting t together two riffs will, will work out for you. But usually I don't really, you know what it is, man? The way I write songs is I just kind of wait for the right parts to come in the song. I don't want to say the song writes itself because it doesn't necessarily write itself, but it kind of like, as the song develops, I could feel like where I want to drive it rather. And, and when you're writing songs in a capacity, like with a typical song, folk song structure where you're doing the typical verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, like a lot of that's easy to kind of dissect because it's laid out for you. But not, of course, not all songs are like that. Um, it's just really a feeling of emotion. But typically, a lot of times, man, and this might sound weird, but it's just about putting two riffs together. And, and if they sound good, then, then you know, hopefully they sound good. Um, and if they don't, then it's it's back to the drawing board. But it's but I, I don't. I don't go into it with, with like, I need to have a song like this and I have the whole song mapped out. And then I just kind of like, it's like puzzle pieces, putting them together. It's, it's more of like a, um, well, let's see, let's see what this needs. Like, I think I have a verse and I think I have a chorus. Will this thing, do I need a bridge like this tempo? And, and if I have a certain riff that sounds good, well, then that's the tempo it's going to go to because this riff sounds really good coming out of that part. Um, one of the things I think I do a lot, like one of the things I related to with a lot was there's a Guitar Center video with James Hetfield and they're interviewing them and they're talking to him. And one of the things he says about his own guitar playing is that he's like, yeah, you know, I'm just, I think I'm just, I, he was talking about how he was really rhythmic with his, with his playing and he feels like he's, he's trying to play drums, but on the guitar. And that kind of made a lot of sense to me. Like, not to say like, I'm, I'm nothing like Hetfield. Like I'm just, 
Hetfield's like you know one of the one of the gods who ever picked up a guitar. He's he's on the top of the list. But like I I see that a lot. Like I like going from certain um, rhythmic things, like between the vo- verse and the chorus, or between the chorus and the bridge, or whatever the next part is. Like I always I, I do feel like rhythmically the riff needs to be different to stand out. Like that's where the payoff really comes is how different do these two riffs sound together, but at the same time. It, it, let me rephrase that. You're looking to find like two parts that go together, but also like that are so different from each other that when you do go to that second part, that the payoff is big. Yeah, and I, I think the th- that's an excellent Headfield quote, right? I'm playing I'm playing drums on the guitar, and I, I can hear that in I can hear that in nail stuff, right? Where you know, sort of like you're saying, you have two parts that go together, and the actual rhythm of those parts is pretty different, and you know, at first it can just get kind of washed out and like the blast beats or whatever, but if you pay attention to where, okay, this is just sort of like, you know, strumming on the open note and then doing like a quick little flurry of stuff that creates oh, an sh- emphasis. And then, oh, did I, did I lose you again? Hey, are you there? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. My iTunes on my computer just played. You didn't pick up any of that, did you? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, good. Okay. Sorry about All that. Good. No, totally. We, um, yeah, I was saying that, um, you know, playing drums on the guitar makes a lot of sense for the way that nail songs are written because, you know, you have these, these riffs that go together that the, you know, the, the actual rhythm can sometimes get washed out because it's just over a blast beat. So it just sounds like it's driving the whole time. Yeah. It's like, okay, you know, the, 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 the tail on this one is like this long and sits in this spot. But then when you go into the chorus part, you know, the actual emphasis is at the beginning of the riff. So it suddenly flips and, you know, you may not realize why that's exciting, but like, it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. And that's, um, it took me a long time to realize that when I, when I heard that video from Hetfield, I was like, it was like a light shine. It was like, Yo, that, that's what I try to do too. Like it's, it's, it's not so much like, like you could play one riff and the second riff and go into the second riff and have it be in the same key. But like the subtlety of the rhythm is what really, like if you, if you're going from one rhythm to another and it, it could just really make things awesome. Like that's what I always thought like grindcore and power violence were such like, um, rhythmic, um, genres of music and not so much like in the groove way you know what i mean not like right you know not like sepultura roots like like dudes doing the drum jam together like not rhythmic <laughs> like that but just like <laughs> rhythmic in the way that like like it's like in grindcore and power violence it's they're always changing tempos like it's it, it never generally stays at one tempo for one time for for a very long time and that's something i've always loved like it's like it's always just like pushing the energy like in just different direction, like in the same direction, but through like different, different rhythms. And, and I always thought that was like, that was one of my favorite things about like power violence and grindcore music. Yeah. And to circle back to that deicide record, I think that that's pretty prevalent on once upon the cross too, right? Where there's, there's like a lot of notes, but it's not very melodic. You, you, you might have a hard time like actually singing one of those deicide riffs, but you know where the hits are. And I feel like a lot of nails riffs are like that too, where there's a lot of notes, but it's not something that you're going to be like, oh, let me hum that riff. But you know exactly where like the emphasis is. Yeah. Yeah. D- yeah. Deicide record does that. Absolutely. And they do, they do a lot of, it, they're very, very, very rhythmic. And it's, it, and when you look at the situation, they, their drummer, right, wrote a majority of, of all their material, even some of the earlier stuff. Oh, did stuff. he really? From what I understand, he did a lot of the Damn, earlier stuff that. too. And he, he definitely writes most, if not all of the modern material. So you have, you have a musician who's primarily a drummer who also knows how to play guitar pretty badass. I mean, if he's writing songs like that, he knows how to play guitar pretty well. And, and it's like, well, that makes sense. Like a, a musician who's primarily a drummer is writing these really rhythmic songs because they are. It's yes. A, lunatics on god's creation it's like it's it's all a lot of their riffs are just like as you said very rhythmic yeah i I had no idea he wrote a lot of that stuff i mean especially the stuff on legion that's like hard to play that's not easy that's interesting you know it's funny because that that album to me sounds so fucking anti-social like their first record was like pure death metal like like war like to me, the first Deicide record sounds like the next evolution of what Slayer 
is. Like yeah. that sounds like if they if For someone sure. took rain and blood and made it just to the next level of like death metal style music. That's what it sounds like to me. And then Legion, it was almost like they were like the first DSI record's insanely catchy. And I think that that has a lot to mainly do with like the vocals and how they how they do their vocal hooks and shit and what they're actually saying. It sounds cool. But um Legion is like just pure fucking madness. Like and it's there's like there's like there's not a not a very hooky record. No. I mean, I, th- I think that that's one of the strangest, the strangest records from that, like, whatever, early 90s death metal. Like, it, nothing else sounds like that. Like, it's like, where did this come from? This is some weird alien shit that just popped into your brains. What's going on here? Yeah, because Obituary, like, that, you could almost say, like, Slowly We Rot is almost like a hardcore record. Like, it's like one step away from being, like, a hardcore record or, like, even a New York hardcore record of its time. And then Cannibal Corpse is just, just, I would say like, that's like chaotic, but that's more like, uh, all those, all those bands like Cannibal Corpse, Deicide, Obituary, and Morbid Angel, they all sounded very different from each other. I mean, there was a million clones of each one of them, but, but those ones, they were there, even they were like original in their, among perspective of, of just those four bands. Yeah, it's it. You know, the like you said, you can sort of hear where the other ones are coming from, right? Like obituary, like yeah, there, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff that's borderline hardcore, and you can just say, okay, you you guys basically just listen to you know um, Celtic Frost and slowed it down and made the vocals a little bit more crazy, and like here you go, <laughs> yeah, blend that with some hardcore, you have obituary. But yeah, Legion is just like I don't know, I don't even know what you guys are doing. This is really strange. They, they, I knew exactly what they were doing. They were just doing a ton of that Florida meth. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's and probably steroids just and true. steroids. That's when the that's when the, uh, the those brothers got buff, dude. The Hoff, yeah, the Hoffmans were were big boys around that time, dude. I I saw them. Um, I I'm glad I got to see Deicide with the Hoffman brothers, dude. I never did. That's uh, the, were, were they big boys? Were they big tacklers? Oh, dude, they were huge. I saw them like April 2001. It was like right when we got back from recording the Carry On album in Massachusetts, and me and my buddy Scott went to the troubadour in la dsi was playing i think they were on i think they're on that record incinerate him i think it was like yeah, yeah yeah it wasn't a very good record and i think it was like more of a con- contractual obligation like they they really phoned it in on that record but i just remember going there and and like it was the first time i ever saw anybody do cocaine and it was like <laughs> it was a real eye-opening experience like I, I would every now and then go to like a metal show in LA, but like this one, I was like, I was like 19. I like, I felt like I, I, I knew a little bit more about the world then. And it was like, wow, yeah, you're, like, you're like, hello, crazy. I'm in a youth crew band. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, but I was, I don't know. I always, I always listened to that. Not always, but I mean, I was, was, was even though, even though like, yeah, youth crew was my thing. I was still pretty aware of like a lot of other, like, uh, mainly metal and hardcore like genres worth of music dude well todd we've been talking for about an hour a little over so if you want people to listen to your podcast what should they do yeah you go to unsilentdeathpodcast.com that's pretty easy um if they have spotify or apple they should just be able to search on silent death podcast and and it's it's in both of those platforms as well but if you just want to listen to uh outside of podcast outside of apple Podcasts and spotify you can just go to the url on silent death podcast.com and you've been doing it for probably about two months maybe a little over do you, do you have any episode that you think people should start with from the from the first crop of them yeah i would start with i would say start with will putney arthur and the first three, basically, I feel like those, I mean, they're, uh, to be honest, they're getting better as I go along because I'm learning more about audio and I'm also learning about, <laughs> about like how I, how much I speak over people and I'm cutting that shit out and I'm just, I'm, I'm cleaning up my own, um, my own vocabulary, I guess I'm trying to learn how to speak more, uh, direct, which if you've made it this far into this podcast, you probably couldn't tell because I just tend to blather and say words that don't make sense, but um, I've been trying to clean it up and get better. So probably the more recent ones would be good, but honestly, all of them are pretty awesome. Um, 
the the one with Nikki from Nothing was real cool. The one with Riley from Sound and Fury, and uh, I don't know. They, I'm I'm getting better as time goes on, but I think they're all pretty okay. I, I've enjoyed all the ones I've listened to, so they all have my endorsement as well. Dude, thank you, thank you so much. And um, Nails is on all platforms, and people can listen to that as well. Yeah. Um, hopefully we can get an album out. I'm not sure what's going on with this COVID situation, but, um, you know, um, I, I hope to record an album at the end of the year and hopefully we can get it out by spring. So we can go play some shows. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, the best thing to do would be to send it to one of your friends who also likes podcasts. If you want more, I have an email list where I send out a weekly update with all the podcasts I've recorded and articles that I've written. I also include my favorite things that I've been reading or listening to as well. You can sign up for that at www.toddneve.com. That's I before E. Or you can open up the show notes in your podcast player and click the link in there. 